My brothers and sisters, I love you. Thanks for being with us. The Lord loves you so much, it's ridiculous. And that's why he created you for joy. Someone who loves you wants you to have joy. And he wants you to enjoy your life. His first miracle was turning water into wine. What part of enjoy your life are you not understanding here? In moderation, of course. Can I hear an amen to that? And one of the key rules for enjoying your life and for living in the joy that God made you for is to be disciplined, it's not just a passive thing, but to be really disciplined about having fun. That's rule number four in the book, Living Joy, which by the way, if you don't have it yet, you need to get it. Go to all the Formed and Augustine Institute websites and stuff like that, or Amazon, wherever the heck you can buy it, you'll, you'll find it and share this stuff with your friends. We're gonna dive into this rule, have fun. Now, if you're a devout follower of this show, <laughs> Several months ago, I covered this topic, but I really wanted to cover it again in greater detail and length because last time I went here, we prefaced it with a little segment where we talked about some controversial church news, which I was reviewing this episode, is the opposite of fun. And it relegated the fun topic to like seven minutes at the end of the episode. I wanted to actually take a deep breath, give this a little more time. As the world gets messier and more serious, it becomes more spiritually important that as a spiritual discipline, we have fun. We're diving all into what that means and how to do it. Thanks for watching. So it's just me today, no guest, but I'm here for you. So if you want to text and interrupt my entire thought flow while I'm speaking, feel free to do that. I'll pause, I'll answer your question. Text your questions to 720-650-0100. Now, if you read the book Living Joy, which I hope you have by now, or if you heard me talk about joy, I, I kick off that topic with a, with a pretty serious story uh, where my dad had a heart attack in front of me. I raced him off to the hospital, and I was praying to God he wouldn't die in the car seat next to me. We got him in the, the intensive care unit, and um, the doctor came back in the room after some scans with a very grim look on his face. And by the grace of God, my dad is doing really well today. So thanks to all those who prayed for him. Uh, but we thought we were going to lose him, and this is one of the heaviest moments of my life. Not only because I was about to say goodbye to my dad, but because my mom was married to him for 49 years at the time, was sitting next to me, and we're just watching him. And the nature of heart disease, if you've had to live with this kind of thing in your family, is that when things aren't going well, the person could look kind of fine, but you know that at any moment, it, it's over. So in this heavy moment where I thought, this is the end with my dad, he asked me to hold my rosary, he held it against his chest, and then he looked at me and he kind of grinned and he said, I'm posing for my casket right now. And then, <laughs> and then he drove it home by kind of tucking his chin in like this and looking like a dead guy in his casket as a joke. Now, this is a perfect uh, story to introduce not only the entire book, Living Joy, which is about the joy of the Lord in all circumstances, even really rough ones. It's a great story to introduce the topic of fun. See, because in a moment that heavy, uh, humor would be a sign of insanity, wouldn't it? If it weren't a sign of the greatest sanity of all, which is sanctity, which is holiness. A holiness that enables us to rise above the concerns of this world, including something as grave as death, and even in the face of death, to laugh. When humor is a sign of sanctity, then it's also an expression of a great virtue. And it's a virtue we desperately need more of today. Not only because we need it to get through life, we need it to enjoy life as God created us to enjoy. He wants us to live in his joy. But we also need it to be good witnesses. Because when we lose this, we become unattractive to people. People don't want to be around you if you never know how to have fun. I'm just going to say it like it is. It's not evangelistic if, you, if you're sour-faced and serious all the time. And the virtue that helps you to have fun is the virtue most people have never heard of, eutrapalia. Eutra Can you say that with me, boys and girls? Eutrapalia. St. Thomas Aquinas defined eutrapalia as mental relaxation and honorable fun. Now, uh, and he picked this up from Aristotle and talked about eutropalia as a power of the soul, a virtue. And this is not idiotic fun, all right? Ephesians 5, 4, he said, Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk or crude joking, which are out of place for a Christian. So sorry, no bro jokes, okay? 
Crude joking is not what we mean by this. It's a virtue of honorable, clean, quality, good fun. That's St. Thomas Aquinas talked about. And it's a virtue, which means it's not just doing fun things. A virtue is more than that. A virtue is also not the ability to resist certain temptations. A virtue is the presence of something beautiful and good. A virtue is a power in your soul. And when you have that virtue, actions that fit that virtue flow from your soul. Example, we talk about the virtue of purity, of chastity. That's not just the power to say no to things and to refrain from lustful activity. It's the presence of something beautiful. It's the ability to choose something good, to choose to love over lust. And when you have that power, it expresses itself through actions that are fitting to that power in your soul, that power of purity. It's like a muscle. A virtue is like a muscle. The more you work it out, the stronger, the bigger it gets. Isn't it cool to think that the ability to have fun is considered by this great doctor of the church, Thomas Aquinas, to be a virtue, to be a spiritual power up there with virtues like purity, up there with virtues like chastity. How cool. So why is this so important? What does it do for you? The first thing eutropalia does for you is it puts you in your place. It puts you in your place. Listen, you're not God. And if you were God, maybe it would make sense for you to take yourself and all the aspects of your life very, very seriously. Though, frankly, I don't think even God sits in heaven taking himself seriously in that, in that you know, sense where he's, he's not able to be a, a, a joyful, jovial being. All right, but we treat ourselves like God. And there's a great saying that the difference between you and God, God never thinks he's you. Okay, I just summed up every confession that you've ever made. G.K. <laughs> G.K. Chesterton said, I laugh at myself, I don't need a guest, okay? G.K. Chesterton said, angels can fly because they take themselves lightly. And he also said, Satan fell by the force of gravity. You're treating yourself like God when everything is taken very gravely. Someone texted in, how much fun is too much fun? Where do you draw the line between fun and taking care of serious things? Okay, and I'm going to get to this, but... If you don't carve out specific time to have fun and to develop the virtue of, of having fun, even in the midst of serious things, uh, you're not doing it right. All right. You have to carve out focused. It's like prayer time. There's the scripture tells us to pray always. And some people think, well, I don't need to spend focused time on prayer if I just pray always. My work is prayer. No, no, no. If you're not spending focused time on prayer, your work is not prayerful, guaranteed. If you don't have focused time on fun, then all the other things you do you don't bring that virtue of fun into those things, and every activity becomes too serious. It takes on a, on a, on a gravity, gravitas, a gravity, an absoluteness, even in your work. So how much fun is too much fun? Well, look, if it's a virtue, you can't have too much of it, I suppose. You can be having fun even when you're doing serious things. Isn't that a cool thought? Because that virtue is present even as you're doing the bills. You could put a fun twist on it even then. I'm not saying to be an idiot and do your bills carefully, right? But if the question was how much play is too much play, well, obviously, when you start failing at your daily duties, you're playing too much. Um, great example of a man who took himself lightly, St. Philip Neri. St. Philip Neri was regarded as a saint in his lifetime. Now, that's a really hard thing. I, I know what it's like. I mean, living saint, Christopher, <laughs> the person behind the camera is about to throw something at me. Yes, I'm kidding. Uh, but... <laughs> But even, honestly, even like the, the lower level, I'm not regarded as a saint, but like some people treat me like a big deal because like, dude, the, he wrote a book. Most people don't treat me like that. But every once in a while, I encounter that. And um, it can be toxic for your soul to take yourself too seriously. Uh, Archbishop Shappy is a good friend and spiritual mentor of mine. He says, you know, don't, don't ever believe your own press, especially the good press. Don't pay attention to it. Uh, but Philip Neary, everybody took him seriously. Everybody thought he's, he, they rightly thought in his case, that he was a big deal, he's a, he's a living saint. And he showed up at this party he was invited to in Rome with all these dignitaries of Rome and the, the top brass, man, the cardinals of the church, these political leaders, and he shaved half his beard down to the skin. And the other half was really long. He looked like an absolute moron. And you know what he was saying in that moment? Guys, 
don't take me too seriously. Don't take me too seriously. Don't walk around with that weight in your soul. What you start to do is you start to just take care of all your wounds too much. You take offense at things too, too heavily. You're not acting like a Christian when you take yourself too seriously. Uh, the Russian Orthodox monks, our, our brothers and sisters in the Russian Orthodox tradition, they have a beautiful tradition, the monks, called Holy Fools. And if you Google to find a picture of Russian Orthodox monks, they are the most serious-looking religious people in history. They wear these big black flowing robes. They, they often have a humongous cross on, this square black hat, big beard. Holy fools, the spiritual tradition where they just decide, I'm going to act like an absolute crazy person and kind of have fun and be a complete goof. And it doesn't fit the image at all. But it's a way of breaking out of that mold and saying, <laughs> don't take me too seriously. I look really serious. I'm not going to take myself that seriously. Great question came in. How would you classify God's sense of humor? Oh, I love that question. You know what? I'm not going to answer that. I'm going to contemplate that later tonight. Seriously, I'm going to take that to prayer. That's the kind of thing I like to I love to wonder about. One of the great things about being a Catholic is that there's a lot of answers to questions, and you can look at the Summa Theologia and all the great writings of the saints, and everything's black and white, but there's a whole lot of things that aren't black and white that lend themselves to just contemplation. And I, I, honestly, I think that question, I suppose, I suppose we could dive into the logic uh, of answers behind, you know, what is humor and what is God and what is God's humor applied to human uh, definitions of humor. And everything we say about God is, uh, it's not the same when we say it about people. It's similar, but it's not the same thing because God is so infinitely to be honest. We could, but, but I'll tell you what. We, I guess, suppose we could talk for an hour about that, but I'd, I'd rather just take that to prayer and wonder and say there's a whole lot of mystery there. I love that. Sorry. Don't take yourself too seriously. Number two, it preserves your faith. You truly preserve your faith. Why? Because it doesn't just help you take yourself less seriously. It helps you take the things of life that weigh you down less seriously. Check this out. This is from Matthew 13, 22. And Jesus talks about when he preaches the word, some of the seed grows in fertile soil. But one of the main enemies to faith, to the seed of his word growing in the soil of your heart, is the deceitfulness of wealth and the worries of this life. And he, and he explains to his apostles the teaching of the seed that fell among thorns. He said, the seed falling among thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and deceitfulness of wealth choke the word. So the seed tries to grow into a plant, and like thorns surrounding it, it chokes it out, making it unfruitful. The stuff of this world is important, guys. I, I, you know, I'm not irresponsible. I have six kids, two grandkids, four dogs. <laughs> I have a lot of mouths to feed, a lot of people to support. I take stuff like work very, very seriously. I take the concerns of my job really seriously, not only because it feeds my family, but because it's ministry and I care about you. And I care about the, the wealth and the health of the church. But everything I do to make a living and to serve the church has a relative importance in relation to God. And when I bring a spirit of fun and levity to it, it shows me that these things aren't absolutely important. Only God is. And let me go a step further. I'm not just talking about paying the bills, guys. Even the stuff of God. What do I mean by this? Some people treat the things of, of Catholic faith that have come from God, the traditions of how we worship, for instance. Guys, this stuff is very, very important. This stuff is very, very sacred. But if we treat it as an absolute, if we don't have a, a lightness in our soul, even when we consider things from God and stuff of the faith, all these things given to us to help us encounter God, if we treat them as absolutes and put them on a level with God himself, we lose our perspective. And this is why you can see a lot of Catholics today in the midst of liturgy wars, for instance, not only say, look, I'm going to engage this, this battle and help the church become healthy, but no, become very curmudgeonly and angry in spirit. Uh, I'll be talking with Father Ripperger about this one probably and next time he's back on. Uh, where he, he reflects on how there's, he's an exorcist friend of mine, how there's no positive thoughts in hell. Right? And this happens even, you know, the devil's motto is anything but God, even things from God. 
You know, St. Francis broke through it all and he said, my God and my all. That's what Catholicism is about. The only thing that, that ultimately matters in the end is God himself. Right? But having a light spirit, which comes about through the virtue of eutropelia, the ability to have fun, puts everything, every concern of this world, even spiritual things that help us climb our way to God or where, wherein he climbs his way down to us and encounters us, puts all these things in the right perspective. Great question. Did Jesus have fun with his disciples? This is another one of those things I could bring to prayer. I would imagine, yes, he did. You know, he was like us, Scripture says, in all things but sin. People like to have fun, guys. You know, so he was like us in his desire to have fun. And I would imagine that one of the unspoken things in, in Scripture is just in, in those endless hours with the apostles, hanging out to the wee hours where Jesus had fun with them. Absolutely. So it puts you in your place. It preserves faith by putting the concerns of this world and all things that pass after this life in their proper place. Number three, it preserves relationships. It preserves relationships. Uh, one of the most important things that I've learned in the course of my marriage is something that me and Natalie call bracketing our problems. Now, we've had some very intense times in marriage. Now, and when, when a couple's dating, and I've met lots of dating couples who are in love, <clears throat> you never... Uh, actually, the one's behind the camera, right? She, the dating behind the camera, right? You meet the person you're going to marry someday. I'm actually making this really awkward. You don't know if you're going to marry him yet, do you? Anyway. <laughs> Sorry, Jorge. So, right? You meet the person you're going to marry someday. You fall. It might happen. I hope it does. You fall in love and you're thinking like, nothing will ever go wrong in this relationship. You're taking your vows on your wedding day. And you're thinking for better or for worse, pff, there will be no for worse. That lasts for about five minutes, right? It's like, it's like going up the, I don't know, the roller coaster, and then it's like, this is all perfect, and you get married. <laughs> it's up and down. It's all over the place like it's crazy. The bills, not only the bills and the, and the concerns of life and juggling all this stuff with kids, so many wounds come up because you get that close to somebody. Everything that's gone wrong in your childhood, all these self-perceptions that are off, all your insecurities just get triggered. And within my own marriage, man, it led to places, uh, not only within my wife, but within me, as she struggled through healing from childhood sex abuse. And by the way, if you haven't seen the episodes where I've interviewed Natalie about this, you got to Google that. It's powerful stuff. Just Google Chris Stefanik Show, interviews his wife Natalie about healing from sexual trauma. Um, there were moments in my marriage where I just literally got to my knees and prayed, Lord, I can't do this. You have to help me. By the way, that's one prayer Jesus has always, always, always answered. When I call upon the grace of that sacrament of marriage and say, Jesus, you promised me you'd help me get through. You promised me your power for this relationship. Give it to me. Every time he does. He lifts me up and he preserves my heart. But during those really intense times in our marriage, we had a discipline that we called bracketing your problems. We'd go out on date night, usually right after her counseling session, where she'd be dealing with stuff that was so intense, she wanted to literally vomit. Okay, this is how intense the stuff she was dealing with was. And we'd sit down over some sushi and sake, which is not always cheap, but it's much cheaper than, uh, than marriage counseling in addition to her counseling. By the way, you either have date night or marriage counseling. It's going to be one expense or the other, all right? And we said, look, we're going to bracket our problems. We're going to bracket the concerns about the kids, the concerns about work. We're not going to talk about any heavy stuff. We're just going to enjoy each other right now. Because I can't tell you how far that went in preserving our love for one another. It's a way of sitting down and proclaiming to each other, all this stuff we're dealing with is not us. This is separate from us, and us is more important than that stuff that we're dealing with. This can apply to any relationship. Parents, you've got a kid that is driving you crazy in your house. And if you don't yet, wait till your kid is a teenager. Your kid will drive you crazy. You get in a, in a mode, amen, Justin? <laughs> the, the crew in the back is like, yes. You get in a mode, though, where it's like, I've corrected this kid 10 times today, and I'm just angry at him. But you got to chill out and say, I'm going to bracket that. I'm going to put brackets around. I'm going to put it aside. I'm just going to have fun with my kids. One of the most important things you could do when you're in conflict with someone you love is to forget about the conflict and just have fun with that person. Great question. Salvation is a serious matter. How can we have fun without teetering into lukewarmness? 
You're gonna teeter into lukewarmness if you don't have fun because you're gonna get tired. The, Luke, eutropalia is a virtue, it's a power in your soul. It's not a sign of weakness. Look, when I bracket my problems with my wife, when this intense stuff's going on, I'm saying, I'm gonna put this aside and we're gonna love each other right now and we're just gonna ha have fun. That's not shallow, guys. That's absolutely profound. The ability to have fun in those moments is a virtue, it's a power in your soul, and it takes work, man. So, eutropalia puts you in your place, preserves your faith, preserves your relationships. Number three, it proclaims the power of the gospel to all the people around you. Why? Because if you go through life taking everything that happens to you so seriously, and you have an inability to push back on the darkness by just having fun and being light-spirited in a heavy moment, what you're telling the people around you with is, hey, this stuff I'm dealing with is the most important thing in life. I think of my dad joking around on his deathbed. That was a proclamation of the gospel to me as his kid. That, Chris, I believe. I believe in the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Are you able to have fun even with terminal illness? That's a powerful witness. It's not easy. Push through the difficulty. Virtues are built by by leaning in and working the muscle and building it up. Amen? But it proclaims the gospel to my children. When I'm able to have fun, even when I'm stressed about the bills, it proclaims the gospel to, to them that, <clears throat> you know what? The body's more important than clothes. Life is more important than food. Jesus provides for your dad enough for him to sit down and be goofy with you for a minute. And then number five, eutropelia, it helps us share humanity together. You know, I, I think of my little granddaughter, Maeve, and she takes me seriously because I'm three times her size. She takes me seriously because if I step in the wrong place, I can crush her entire small body. I'm a large presence to Maeve. She loves me, but she takes me seriously. When I just like get down to her level and I'm silly, it's like, ah, I'm gonna play, like I'm hide and seek with you. Like I'm gonna run after you, ah, you know? I, I just lower myself in this level. There's something beautiful about her expression that changes. It's like the veil between us just comes right up and she peeks under there and she sees, ah, oh, Grandpa, he's just a person like me. <laughs> That's a beautiful thing, man. Uh, someone asks, as a dad, it's hard to be present with my kids and family when my mind keeps wandering to stressful things. Yeah, brother, I know, it's hard. If it were easy, we'd call it a vice. It's hard, it takes a virtue. Can I just tell you, I need you to keep trying. I need you to keep trying. I need you to keep pushing away those things and not just pushing them away, but replacing them with other things. If you can't stop obsess obsessing about something at work, it doesn't have to be the most quality thing in the world. Take out shoots and ladders and play it with your kid. Do something stupid like that. Distract your mind and focus it on something else. So how to be silly, which that, that's a perfect segue into how to. Number one. I'm sorry, how to develop the muscle, the spiritual power of eutropalia. Number one, be silly. What do I mean by that? I mean, just, just be goofy sometimes. You used to do this as a kid. When did you get so boring? St. Teresa, no offense. Well, a little bit. St. Teresa of Avila said, uh, a sad nun is a bad nun. I am more afraid of one unhappy sister than a crowd of, of demons. <laughs> Whoa. What would happen if we hid what little sense of humor we had? Let us humbly use our humor to cheer others. Be humorous, even if you're not really good at it. They're gonna see that you're loving them, you're reaching out to them to try to cheer them up. I love Oscar Wilde's last words. He said, either this wallpaper goes or I do. Even in the darkest moments, you can insert humor. I love one of St. Lawrence's last words. He was asked, by the way, to, to show um, the emperor where the treasures of the church were. And he said, give me some time, I'll gather them for you. And he gathered all the poor of the city of Rome, and he said, these are the treasures of the church. What a beautiful reflection. Read Matthew 25, by the way. Jesus associates himself with those who are needy and poor. When we serve them, we serve Jesus. When we fail to serve them, we fail to serve our Lord. The final exam, Matthew 25, the final exam. Uh, but his penalty for that was to be uh, burned slowly alive, roasted at the stake, and when they burnt half his body slowly, he said, turn me over, I'm done on this side. 
humor in desperate pain. And to add almost a macabre humor to that, he's the patron saint of, of grill masters, chefs, and barbecue. I, I, I like thinking about that, but not too much because I, I don't want to think about like his crispy flesh while I'm making my burger. <laughs> but what a powerful proclamation of the gospel. He said, even my body has relative importance here. I'm going to insert silliness into the darkest moment imaginable. Well, my kids are at each other's throats fighting. This happens a lot in my home. We have all alpha dogs in my house, man. You ever see six alpha dogs in one small space together? Uh, I, I often just, we're driving down the freeway and they're fighting, they're at each other's throats. I just turn like Rafi on or uh, look up David Casey. He's got an awesome children's album, Best Day Ever. And I'll blast it. And they're trying to fight. And, and there's a song like, I like to golf, but more than golfing. I like to watch golf on the TV. Good luck fighting with such silliness. Or maybe even weirder, I, uh, I love the soundtrack for Pee Wee's Big Adventure. It's really impossible to be too serious and to fight with that playing in the background. <laughs> Do you think going to confession with Padre Pio was fun? No. Actually, I don't know. I, I do sometimes crave going to confession with someone who could read my soul because I just want to get the job done. Like, I've been to therapy lots of times, and, and a lot of times, like, a, you know, therapists are trained to take their time and be like, you know, uh, we're going to let you see your own problem and come to a realization. And I'm sitting down, I'm like, dude, this is 100 bucks an hour. Would you just tell me what's wrong with me? So I, I don't know. It would be fun for me. So be silly. Number two. Do quality, fun things with intentionality. What do I mean by that? Perfect example of this is golf. That's a quality, fun thing. When you lose your intentionality, if you're a golfer, you might come home after having spent three or four hours away from your family. Your family's hoping you'll come back refreshed, and you're cursing the universe. Why? You're throwing your golf clubs around. Why? Because you've lost the intentionality. You need to put intentionality behind your actions or your will just starts to grab onto all sorts of the wrong directions and you lose the whole point of it all. I love um, boxing, I love Brazilian jiu-jitsu, I studied these things. I started losing intentionality with this stuff myself. I, I was maybe five years ago, uh, I, I, my boxing instructor was like, dude, you need to fight in, in the ring. You're, you're pretty good at this. And I, and I was literally thinking, I, yeah, I'm gonna do that. And then I'm gonna show up preaching at an event with a broken nose and a black eye? But I literally almost did it because I went from having fun to losing the intentionality, which was supposed to be fun and fitness and self-defense for my family, to I want to be a professional fighter. No, dude, you're a preacher. Okay, that's not, You're a 40-year-old preacher with multiple children. <laughs> that's not your job. Keep the intentionality behind it. Maybe by saying it to yourself out loud. John Paul II, uh, he was challenged when he was a cardinal. And he said, isn't it unbecoming for a cardinal to go skiing? Aren't you supposed to be serious all the time? And he said, no, it is unbecoming for a cardinal to ski badly. He was intentional about his fun. Let me tell you what happens when you're not intentional about quality fun. You end up inserting bourbon all the time. I'm not trying to shame you if you like your bourbon, all right? When it becomes the only way to let off steam, the only source of fun, you're on your way to a serious problem. But this is what happens when we don't have quality fun that we're intentional about, thinking about. We end up inserting the lowest hanging fruit all the time. So how do you develop eutropalia? All these, all these virtues take work. Be silly. Two, do quality fun things with intentionality. Three, waste time having fun with people you love. Waste time having fun with people you love. You know, I, I have heard this line many times from fellow dads. You know, I'm really busy lately, but it's not the quali quantity time that matters with my kids. It's the quality time. To which I would reply, that is a load of garbage. Quality time is important. Quantity time communicates something to the people you love that just quality time could never communicate. It communicates, dads, to your kids, you, child, are worth me, a big, important dad, wasting my time on. You're not just something in my schedule. This schedule is about you. Life is, is about more than the stuff that I'm checking off of my schedule on a given day. One of my fondest memories as a kid, sitting down with my Uncle Dan and just hanging out and watching Mr. Rogers. How cool is that? And I was like seven years old, and at least guys sitting down next to each other, 
just arms touching, watching TV, this isn't considered quality time. Some people might say, you know, I, what's, you know we, we should really think a lot more about the blah, 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 blah. No, guys, this was so meaningful to me as a kid. I thought, I, I'm worth this man wasting time on and just sitting here to communicate something about my value and about my worth. I, I love this, guys. Thinking about fun as a virtue. Thinking about the fact that God wants you to have fun. That God, if he were here with you right now in the flesh, he'd want to sit down next to you and just watch TV sometime. Because you're worth wasting time on. And Jesus said it pleases the Father to give you the kingdom. Because you're not just a human doing. You're a human being. And I think Eutropalia reminds you of that. That you in who you are have inherent value and worth such that God the Father found you worth sending God the Son to die for. Certainly, it's worth it. You're worth it. Just hanging out and having fun. I want to end with this beautiful quote from G.K. Chesterton. <clears throat> he said, I would much rather be ruled by men who know how to play than by men who do not know how to play. It is not only possible to say a great deal in praise of play, it is really possible to say the highest things in praise of it. It might reasonably be maintained that the true object of all human life is play. Earth is a task garden. Heaven is a playground. To be at last in such secure innocence that one can juggle with the universe and the stars to be so good that one can treat everything as a joke, even death. That may be, perhaps, the real end and final holiday of human souls. The Lord loves you. He created you for joy. He wants to see you joyful. Lean into that. Do what it takes. Develop that virtue of eutropalia as part of your your journey to a living joy that doesn't only start now, it lasts forever. God love you. Thanks for being with us. Man, wasn't that great? Listen, if you don't want to be happy, be sure not to subscribe. But if you want a more joyful life, the kind of life that God created you for, the kind of life Jesus promised when he said, I came to give you life to the full, then make sure you hit subscribe and share this channel with everybody you know.